Welcome to this week's edition of Inter-University Debate. Inter-University Debate is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV. I'm your moderator for this debate. My name is Dake Jenda Fancy. I'm an advocate, a lecturer, and a tax consultant. For this week's Inter-University Debate, we have students from Nkumba University. Inter-University Debate is a platform where students are able to meet and dialogue and have discussions on matters that affect the county and this week like i mentioned we have students of nkumba university nkumba university students you're welcome to today's debate Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. before i introduce the topic for today i would like to first introduce my panelists for today i have two ladies and two gentlemen our first panelist is a gentleman on my extreme left. He is called Mr. Harold Sewanonda Victor. He is a student pursuing Bachelor of Laws in his third year at Nkumba University. Victor, you're welcome to inter-university debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Gender Lakeo Francis. Okay. Thank Francis. you. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned it rightly. Don't worry. Okay. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Our second panelist for today, we have Ms. Veronica Nasonko. She is a student also pursuing Bachelor of Laws at Nkumba University in her third year. Veronica, you're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Pansi. I'm honored. Okay. Thank you. Our third panelist for today is Mr. Amanya Abdu. He says he's an historian in his third year at Nkumba University. Abdu, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. A very good afternoon to you and the viewers. Okay. Last but not least on our panel today, we have Ms. Wembabazi Proskovia. She is pursuing Bachelor of Laws in her third year, and currently she's the Guild Registrar at Nkumba University. Proskovia, you're welcome. Much obliged, Jenna. Thank you. I'm glad that our panel, as usual, is gender balanced. So today we are discussing a topic that we have discussed before and is something that is very pertinent. It is the state of multi-party politics in Uganda. Now, in the year 2005, Ugandans voted for a multi-party state. And that was after a long period of the movement political system. Initially, in 2001, Ugandans still had a referendum on whether they should have a multi-party state. However, Ugandans overwhelmingly voted against the multi-party politics until in 2005 when finally they voted for the multi-party politics in Uganda. Years down the road, several events have unfolded. We have seen political parties participate in elections, uh, plus that we have also seen crossovers from uh, one party to, the na to another. We have seen NRM members crossing over to opposition, opposition crossing over to NRM, and also opposition uh, uh, crossovers from one party to the other. Minus that, we have seen several elections go by. We have seen the issues of Soroti by election and several issues, complaints about electoral reforms. We have seen complaints about iPod and several other issues that we are going to unpack today, including the NRM DP cooperation agreement. So let's get into the discussion, students of Nkumba University. And I'm going to start right from the first panelist, and that is Victor. So Victor, our topic is the state of multi-party politics in Uganda. Let's start from what do you understand by multi-party politics? All right, uh, thank you so much. What I understand by multi-party politics, uh, it's, it's basically in, in the simplest of time, terms or something known as a no-brainer, it is us having more than two political parties in a certain country, whereby we have very many different political parties like NRM, DP, uh, like NRM, DP, FDC, very many of them competing favorably under favorable conditions. We actually get to have them having parliamentary seats. For example, if at all this is an MP of Wakiso in this year, then we could actually have one from DP in one term, then one from NRM, then one from DP. From NUP. So it's an all-round political system whereby different political parties with different leaders and different ideologies compete favorably in a political system of a country, which differs from that dual party system where you only have two political parties or are uh, 
a, a system without any political party at all, as Uganda was during the movement system. So basically, what I understand with multi-party system is having very many different political parties competing favorably. It's what it's supposed to be, competing favorably under political environment within a country. Okay, I'll definitely get back to you, Victor, a bit on that aspect of that is what it's supposed to be. Oh, sure. Yeah, no we'll have that discussion, sure. All right, all right. Okay, let me move to Veronica. So, Veronica, what is the... Take us through the history of multi-party politics in Uganda. Uh, okay, the history of multi-party politics. I've heard very many stories about it. Like, very many. Some say the history starts from 1962 at the, the day of independence and others say it could be 1986 so it is something kind of a different disorganized story so i think with all due respect i should pass it on to the historian to help me with that oh okay yes. oh yeah luckily <laughs> enough we have an historian here so yes. mr historian mm. what is the history of multi-party politics all right thank you so much once again my name is abdu and i to answer that, one, a person who is interested in discussing multi-party politics in Uganda must look into history, first of all. Now, we are not going to start uh, discussing this from the time when Uganda got its independence. Um, let's look at how the British came to us. By 1894, we became a protectorate, but how did the people, how did the British get full authority over Uganda? They made alliances with the people, right? Now, um, <clears throat> history tells us that whereupon the British arrived in Uganda, they made alliance with the Buganda kingdom, and they failed in another state called Adyatoli. They fought against the, uh, the Banyoro. Now, you realize that these are not political parties, but these are ethno parties. They affiliate, they have, um, they, they, they subscribe to the leadership. So under that um, situation, we can consider them to be parties in their own way, the political parties, but not in the contemporary way, the way it is right now. Now, let's set that aside. You would say that at the eve of independence, 1962, what happens? There was um, an alliance between the, 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 the royal kingdom of Buganda and the political party, UPC. Now, you, are, you, you begin to appreciate the ethno parties, the parochial states, forming themselves into political parties, and that's why we have the Kabaka Yeka enter into alliance with, um, with the UPC in order to give birth to, uh, to, to, to an independent state, Uganda. But then we had other political parties, the DP inclusive, and who were the subscribers of the DP? You realize that um, the history of Uganda has been characterized by sectarianism and tribalism or tribal sentiments. You, you, you see one um, society having so much attachment to a particular party or a particular religion having so much affiliation to another political party. So you realize that um, the incident of uh, multi-party politics in Uganda started a long time ago. But this is not the gist. Someone who is to talk about multi-party politics would be obliged by all standards to talk about how it has functioned altogether. If you give me latitude to venture into that right now, I can go on. Unless otherwise... Yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Sure. exactly. Now, you realize that uh, from the time go, we have experienced feud in this country. There's been a grave misunderstanding amongst the political parties logging horns each and every time. Now, this is to tell you how tragic the situation of multi-party uh, multi politics has been in Uganda. Um, you remember... The, the unceremonious alliance that I just talked about between the Kabaka Yeka party and the UPC. This was a, this was a marriage of convenience. It wasn't a, a, an alliance based on principle or there was no a, ideological proximity between Kabaka Yeka and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the UPC. UPC. Exactly. Now, you realize that these people only did this for the interest of winning power. Hold it together. Now, what happens upon getting the power? The Kabaka, uh, the Kabaka party, the Kabaka Yeka party had its own uh, ideas. Um, the UPC also has its own um, fundamental uh, framework, which they believe in. So there was no ideological proximity between these two parties here. 
the marriage wasn't of convenience anyway. It was for power. And upon getting the power, you definitely see in the subsequent events unfolding that in 1964, the marriage had to be aborted. They divorced. And this culminated into a fierce feud in 1966 to the extent that the Kabaka had to flee his own country and leave out his people. That's how tragic it was. But that was just the start. This would continue on altogether. Now, we also recall um, a tragic incident when Apollo Milton Obote was disposed of the government. He fled into exile, but he wasn't alone. There are so many political fugitives who ran into exile. And what happens? One, when, uh, 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 at the period of one, 1979, when they said, no, this must stop, I mean, must leave power, they decided to gang. Uganda National Liberation Front. I mean, sorry, was formulated. Ugandans in exile together with uh, Tanzanian sympathizers came overthrowing. They made an alliance. How together? They made an alliance. And after this alliance, upon capturing power, Yusuf Rule was thrown into power, but he stayed for 68 days, if my memory serves me well. 68 days, yeah, or thereabout. He left power. So you would say that multi party politics um, does not function does not function the way it ought to. People simply come, they form a nucleus on conveniences. And upon achieving that small thing that they do desire, it, it ceases its meaning altogether. But this is my honest thought about political parties or, how, or, or what they ought to be. Um, a political party must have what it stands for. It should be known. Okay, let's set aside the bus. Let's set aside the whole. It must be bigger than that. A political party must represent the aspirations of the people. It, it, it must be independent of the individuals, of their founders. That's why you see at the time when Yusuf Rule leaves power, that marked the end of that party there <coughs> altogether. So Ugandans are being rallied behind individuals, but not behind ideas. Now, a political party must, first of all, represent what the country stands for. We should not be wooed because the majority are the other side there, altogether. Now, having seen that um, the fu a fundamental flaw in our party, in the political parties in Uganda, is one, getting masses, but not giving the ideas or what the country stands for. The country, um, under the national objectives and directive, or principles of state policy, you'd see what Uganda stands for. Democracy, we stand for equity, we stand for good governance, and so on and so forth. But you do not see this in the party politics, in or in their manifestos. What they're interested in is how we get these people here. And it doesn't matter how they get the people altogether. People don't genuinely subscribe to these parties. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you for that uh, historical analysis. Mm -hmm. But Abdul, I would also like to ask you, yes. uh, based on your discussion, mm. when Ugandans voted for mm. multi-party politics in 2005, mm. do you think Ugandans understood what they were getting into? Now, this is the tragedy. Uh, um, upon Mr. Museveni coming to power, we see in 1980, he, uh, he ventured into the movement system. There were no parties competing against him, right? Now, it was not until the World Bank, by the way, and the International Monetary Fund chose to embark on the structural adjustment policy that affected nearly every one of the conditions to Mr. Museveni for him to sustain his power, his stay on power was he must accept multi-party politics. Okay, I have my own sentiments about multi-party politics. I'll set that aside for now. But my, the, 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 the gist of my argument is this. We do not accept this fully. We do not, we do not receive multi-party politics into Uganda by ourselves. Yes, it is in the Constitution. Article 69 makes it a point that Uganda must be a multi-party state. Article, Article 69, close to B, to that effect there. Um, we have it. But in practice, okay, what are they doing anyway? Ugandans have not fully understood um, the political parties and how they operate. If you remember very well at the, at the dawn 
of uh, colonialism in Africa, parties were formed. And how are these parties formed? The worker unions, the trade unions, they came together and subsequently they ended up turning into political parties. Look at Kanu. Kanu started, Kanu in, in Kenya, started as a, a, as a trade union, traders coming together and subsequently they, they, they became a political party. Now, you realize that there's something these people were looking at. Fairness in employment, wages, and maybe also having chance to trade fairly against other people. Those were the things they stood for. Those were what, 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 they, what they subscribed for. At the end of the day, it culminated into party. And people who subscribed to that party did it genuinely knowing very well that that party would drive them not only to political independence, but also to economic freedom. Now, on the contrary in Uganda, okay, what do we have to say that, um, okay, what was the genesis for NRM? In the, for instance, um, much theories could be advanced, but I do not believe in them. If at all, they were genuine, would say them. The, 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 the narratives or the, the notion suggest that um, Mr. Museveni went to the boss because of uh, uh, anarchy in the country, because of disrespect to, uh, of human rights. And, and it, 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 there was an election that was rigged. There was an election rigged. And these things continue past today. So w what is the essence? You get a point. So you realize that political parties are not formed, were not founded on the fundamental principles that people subscribe to. Okay. Mm. So I see Veronica would like to add something. Uh -huh. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And to answer your question, if the citizens understood multi-party politics, yes, I think they understood multi-party politics. They understood what they were going to, what they were, what they were, de what they were deciding, because they know. Okay, we are going to choose a situation where we shall have different political parties. But I think the question should be: Did they understand multi-party democracy? Because true, we have multi-party politics. Yeah, we really have it, but we do not have multi-party democracy. That should draw the line. They understood the politics, but they don't know the democracy that comes with multi-party politics. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let me just ask you right there. So, um, you said they understood multi-party politics, but they did not understand the multi-party democracy. Yes. Yeah. So in multi-party politics, what do you think the citizens were looking at when they voted for it? Depending, okay, if I'm to look, if I'm to digest this from the perception of a lady in the village, the chairman of the village will tell that lady, you're voting, we are going to have different political parties, that is all. So I, most of them voted because they had been told, please, Vote this because we are going to have different political parties except the NRM. You get? Okay. So they had to say, okay, let us see different political parties coming up. That is why they voted. Okay. Let me bring Proskovia into the discussion. So, Proskovia, we are still talking about 2005. We moved away from history to 2005 now when the citizens of Uganda voted for multi party politics. Do you think Ugandans? made the right choice to move to multi-party politics at that time? At that time, 2005, right? Yes, 2005. Um, I think, yes, they made the right choice because it gives everyone an opportunity to, to serve, to, to be engaged in leadership. And we have seen that in leadership, it's not one, it's a collection of everyone's idea. So when we, get different candidates because the gist of it was to get many people engaged into politics like different people and we have some different that's where you see the opposition you see people in parliament and they're discussing different ideas so it helps us to it, it i think in their perception they did something right because it would be best to see someone only one party participating it there would be no opposition and how would we see the dirty in like the consequences or maybe the effects of that party because it's the position that brings out and we get it through multi party okay thank you let me bring victor back so victor what's the legal framework of multi-party politics in uganda 
All right. So I think the, the legal framework of multi-party politics in Uganda is that, first of all, it's constitutional and under Article 69 to be, as Abdul said. But then again, leaving it being constitutional, I actually think uh, they actually allowed to operate. They were allowed to operate uh, through the question gives the freedom of assembly. Because the, the freedom to belong to belonging to a group or to assemble. So actually, I, th I think that the, the, the legal framework of multi-party politics is actually there, but it's just a legal framework. It's just theoretical. It's not practical. Because if you go to practicability of the whole system, well, that's where naturally it fails. Because very many of our laws in Uganda are actually just laws. They're just there, but they never operate. But then again, the same legal framework of multi-party politics is being undermined by the POMA, by the recent POMA Act that allows the police to actually uh, tie you down if you're rioting, even without a justifiable cause. As long as you're doing something wrong, that is something that's close to rioting, then they're going to tie you down. We actually think that the Public Order Management Act has actually come, or it actually came to destroy the whole freedom of political parties, the whole freedom of association. So we think before this, a framework, a legal framework for political parties to work. But then again, I think right now where we're adjusting to through the POMA, that framework is being undermined. Then at the end of the day, still, even if the laws are actually theoretical, first of all, the laws are theoretical. And then secondly, POMA comes in to undermine the laws which have already been there. So I think where we are going, we're not going to actually end up having a legal framework for the multi-party politics in Uganda. Okay. Let me move to Veronica. So I would like you to pick from where Victor stopped. What would you expect of a multi-party state? Uh, what I would expect of a multi-party state? Okay, to, to, some things are there and other things are really not there. What I would expect of a multi-party state? Everything is there in the statutes. When you read the statutes, everything is there. But these things are not practical, as I said. These things are not really practical. So what I would really expect, first of all, if it comes to multi-party activities, say it elections and the staff, the military should not be involved. That is a national asset, right? So why would one party choose it to, to become a, a party asset? The military should not be involved. It should be a, put aside. It should only intervene if the national security or if maybe one political party has... Okay, let me give an instance in November. I'm not saying what they did was right, but how they came in, how they, the army intervened, to settle the situation of the riots and the staff, it was really called for. But I'm not justifying their killings and the staff. So the military should be put aside. Anything, any national asset should be put aside. The national cars, the national uh, money, everything should be put aside. It should be a party on a party, nothing national. Yeah. Okay. Let me... Um ask Abdul the same question yes yes to add on what uh veronica just talked about and feel free to mm. say otherwise or okay. contradict any panelists absolutely yes. so what what would you <coughs> expect what should the citizens expect mm. you know of a multi-party state all right um like i did say a little bit earlier on that we have objectives as a country that we should achieve that we should strive for now Ordinarily, one would expect that a political party must be in position to rally the masses towards that objective there. But unfortunately, this is the, this is the predicament we have as a country, that the political parties are only destined to removing the incumbent president from power, which is tragic. And how do they do this? Or oh, how would they go about this? They will take each and every a uh, step possible, including the classes, to make sure that this president goes out of power. But this is not so, uh, this shouldn't be the ideal. Um, quickly to go back to the first question you posed to Mr. Harold, whether the legal framework is there altogether. Now you realize that it is there, yes, but I want to withdraw that statement by saying that it's not there because the Public Management Act comes in play. And in this equation here, the Public Management um, Act makes it a point that you cannot convert, you cannot, um, you, you cannot uh, assemble, you cannot rally for any political or economic discourse whatsoever. Once you, the way we are seated here, I'm quite sure you have a pick line says to do this. Otherwise, the police would have the justification to hold us and take us behind bars because we are converging without getting permission from them. But 
one thing we need to understand is that the hallmark of multi-party uh, multi -party dispensation or politics is freedom of speech and expression. This is enshrined in Article 29 of the Constitution altogether. But this is not operational. Sadly, it is not operational. By the time you see a uh, um, noob uh, uh, rallying masses in Arua, be assured that the flying squad will reach there faster than an ambulance will reach there. By the time this is the enters Soroti, there are already forces deployed there. This is the saddest reality altogether. So there is no, uh, th there is no atmosphere where the uh, where masses or political parties can deliberate, can interact with the people freely. But this is also another flaw that I must not forget to talk about: that the parties operate only on the basis of their founders or their leaders. I can uh, assuredly tell you where I come from, for instance, that um, the, 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 the masses cannot hold on to the political objectives of the parties they subscribe to without the leaders being present. So for you to say FDC in my place, basically has to be there. If it's not there, there's no FDC. You can say that, uh, that mistake there. But ordinarily, these parties must function whether with or without the cardinal leaders being present because it's something you believe in sub something you subscribe for but um coming back to the, the, the to, to the environment under which a multi-party uh, political dispensation operates in uganda it is it is laughable it is tragic and uh, one would surely say that uh, we do not have multi-party politics in uganda except for the form but substantively no Okay, mm. so let me leave Proskovia to start right from where you stopped. Mm. So Proskovia, my question to you is that when you look at the existing political institutions, which includes political parties, do they show that we are existing in a multi-party state? Okay, uh, first I will first address to there's some statement he said about when the, the leader is not there, there's no party. But I'll give an example. I come from Hoima and when an MP of FDC stands, we all know that this is FDC. So multi party is still operating even without a, a, a leader. Because personally, when my father speaks, they already know that that is FDC. When we go to Hoima, I'll give an example from my house. So uh, you asked a question about Yes, I asked a question about the existing political institutions. Do they show in their day-to-day -day running of, acti of activities that we are existing in a multi-party state? Yes, they do, because I've, I've been observing that these institutions, they give them the platform to air out and to reach out to the people and to, to really expose what they are willing to do for the people. And I think through that, the platforms that they leave for them, the concerts that they do, and people are like, they advertise themselves and you see that they're freely doing it and at a free will, and no one is influencing them or is sidelining about it, then I'm not sure that Okay, yeah. Open. Permit me to chip in a little bit. Okay, Proskovia, were you done? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's have up. You see, um, let's talk about the legal framework. We do agree that hmm. on form it is there, okay? But substantively, it's not really worth it or it's, it's worth appreciating that it's functional. Now, one, what I want to say is something very important. Under the Constitution, you realize that Article 72 makes it a point that uh, the political parties must actually uh, showcase or demonstrate their sources of fun and how they operate all together. Now, um, coming back to the question you asked prior about how it is operating in Uganda, how, how, how the, the relevance of political parties in Uganda. Now, I want Prosi or any other person here to tell me how or whether at any point in time NRM government has come to account, as a party by the way, come to account for its sources of fun and how they get it from. Let's talk about FDC. Let's talk about uh, all the political parties in this country here. The constitution makes it the point that we can have 
a multi-party political dispensation, you can form political parties, but does not give guarantees or does not warrant the, the, the operation of these parties here. Now, is it the government going to fund them? If not, the government obviously is not going to fund them. How are these people going to raise the funds from? Are they going to do from the masses? How are they going to do this? And what accountability structures are put into place for these people to account for them? You, 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 you note number one, and with deep sadness, by the way, that the parties that are telling, uh, that are rallying the masses against the government for, an, uh, for, 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 for um, lack of transparency, for all sorts of things, also having the same flaws within themselves. So you realize it is very important for the parties, first of all, to sweep the house clean before they even march out. Now, a country that guarantees multi-party dispensation and does not guarantee funding to them, and at worst even curtails them, it is tragic. We, we recall uh, 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 so much during um, the, 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 the recent election that we had, it was last year, yeah? Um, Many funders, accounts have been okay. Many foreign um, organizations, their funds have been, have been. Uh, how do you say it? They have been frozen. You get, a, you get a point. I want to presume that it is these uh, organizations that give allowances, tokens, or fundings to the political parties. We remember the democratic um, governance facility. This account was frozen till last uh, last month when it was open. I do presume, and I'm very rational on this, that this uh, organization was funding the political parties. They were funding iPod as well, but their accounts were frozen. So why do you expect the parties to get their funding from? We do understand that out of the masses, there are only very few people who subscribe and get membership into these parties here. Matters, the parties enjoy that mass support, very few people sub, uh, subscribe to them. And I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious that the, the, the subscription fee will not exceed 5,000. Now, let's assume in a population of um, 42 million Ugandans and only, um, only 500 people subscribe to NRM, for example, official subscribers, members of the party, I'm not a good mathematician, but I want to assume that it's 5 million that will raise. But the operation of NRM alone overwhelms 5 million. It can go into trillions. Where do they get this money from? Now, these questions, Ugandans will not ask. But I'm asking. Maybe I'm an exception, and I'm quite sure you're going to ask the same. Now, if at all there are no structures on ground to check the parties themselves, and then I, d I, I do see that there's a fundamental flaw that we need to fix at once. Yeah, let me put comma here. Maybe uh, I hear the objection from okay. Paul I, or something. Yeah, I see Veronica and Victor would like oh, yeah. to add something. Let me start yeah. with Victor since his hand was up. All right. Uh, that's, that's very good what, what I'm going to say. Though I have mm. many points of supplements, then a mm. point of contention. Okay. So from the very start, there's something I don't want to pass. Uh, where Abdul said that, you know what? Political parties are falling because they are all based on one man leadership. And when that man is out, then that's not there. You see, that looks to be right at the top of it, but let's deep, let's 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 get, let's get deeper. Mm. So, what happens? What happens in a world whereby I have a political party, I am the leader of it, I have an ideology of it, right? And besides me, there are other people. Because when you saw before the forming of DP, people had to sit down in a meeting. So the people who I agreed with, I am only just the head of this, right? So meaning even if I fall, my ideology will still remain alive. But what I will agree with him is that the ideologies as to why you form political parties in the very start was a problem. They were problematic. For example, some political parties, as you see them, uh, like NRM, I'll talk about NRM unapologetically. These are my views and not for civic space TV. What I understand by NRM, during the last debate, I will talk about the last debate I saw on civic space TV about the UCU students, if I'm allowed to. There was a certain gentleman uh, who was only talking about NRM. And I noticed one thing that this gentleman, this gentleman must have been Mnyankoro uh, Amohima. And with everything they were asking him, he was pro NRM. Even things are actually obvious. You see, in, in, like he has said, we just don't ask these questions. And he was just saying yes to everything. Even things that are obviously going wrong, he was saying yes. So what I'm trying to say is that I think the reason as to why you form political parties, the actual root 
is already a problem in this current society. We need to discuss fact that. Like he has said, we need to sweep our house clean. We need to go back to the basics and understand. We need to reformulate new ideologies. We don't have to go through the ideologies of the 1995s or the 1980s. I mean, look at 1995 and 2022. Those are so, so many years that have passed. How sure are we that these same ideologies that NRM has been having, DP has been having, FDC has been having, is still going to work for us? And then again, that is, and then again, uh, going on into supplementing to what he has said, we see NRM using very many state, state resources for their own funding, for their own parties. And it's actually very ar ironic that they are now tripling the iPod fund to 35 billion from 10 billion. But the thing is that they will still give 35 billion to the whole iPod, but the money is given according to the number of seats you have in parliament. And ironically, NRM has more seats at the end of the day. So NRM is actually paying itself with state funds of iPod. And that's just what we see in the daylight. Then what happens what we don't see? We actually see very many state resources being depleted. And that not, not only happens, answering the question you asked, is there a, a fair ground among politics going on? They're not actually going on. Why? Because at the end of the day, Mr. Museven is actually a big bull in the kraal. I mean, he has owned this whole country. Look at... And, uh, look at DP, look at Nobat Mao. Nobat Mao was being dissolved within the NRM. Betty Kamiya was dissolved within the NRM. At the end of the day, we're even having other parties doing the same thing. NRM, for, for instance, Noop and FDC had joined of recently. Well, they are saying, well, we have one member, you don't have to put your member. So actually see that... We also saw the, the DP and Go Forward. Aha. Uh -huh. so, so, so at the end of the day, we are seeing parties getting into groups, clustering themselves, clustering themselves, mm -hmm. which at the end of the day undermines the whole notion of multi-party politics. First of all, the parties in and of themselves, as we have agreed with Abdul, need some sweeping. But then again, secondly, before they sweep their own houses, we're having a dirty house A and a dirty house B combining to make the house even much more dirtier. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we don't have a multi-party politics. This is my standpoint and this is my philosophy. I would actually believe that we would have a better Uganda without political parties, whereby we only have people standing as independent. But that would not happen if NRM is still in power. But then again, the problem we have is that we as a young youth, me especially, we don't know what to do. Because at the end of the day, we say we don't want NRM in power. But then which party has convinced us that they have the best philosophy for the country? I mean, all our other youths are shouting, nope. Robert Chagulani. I myself, I would say I don't see anything in Robert Chagulani that can actually lead the nation. We may want change, but are we ready for change? That is the big question. So I think at the end of the day, we have a framework of multi-party politics. Uh, we have the theoretical laws and everything, but they're not actually operating. And political parties are being stabbed down, like he has said. Camp counts are being frozen at the end of the day. They're not actually operating. And they, they and if they try to rely on foreign funds, they will say this is neocolonialism at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I think the best solution for multi-party politics. I don't know if it is too early to say that, but I think what would be the best solution is if we have a whole reshuffle in the leaders. Mm -hmm. If at all we want to remain the political leaders, let me save any go off. I mean, if we have a very good political system, we should have very many different leaders, not only in the country, but within the political parties. Who says that, that no, no but Mao knows the best for DP mm -hmm. and has been knowing the best for DP since 2000 up to now? Who says he, he's the know-it-all? Who says that supposed to be his messenger for FDC? Mm -hmm. If I, as Harold, son of the victor, I want to stand for a certain post within the FDC, then how do I make sure I stand for presidency with FDC if at all messenger is still there? Party Kaboya Moriat is there and he's going to stand again. I think mm -hmm. we need to have a change. A change in the leaders, even within the parties. Then you can actually preach for a change within the nation. Okay, before I move to Veronica, let me ask you about something that you just talked about. Yes political parties being built based on old ideologies. Ah. So what what do you think has changed or what new thing do you think the political parties should be uh, based on? All right. So what I think, as Abdullah said, the, the new thing political parties should be based on is actually very simple. I actually think we need to go down as a political party to the basics. We need to sit down in a meeting and redo the ideolo ideologies. We see which ideology can take the country forward. An ideology of 1995 or less than cannot be the same ideology to run a contemporary society with youths like us using social media in the current state. You understand? So I think political parties need to sit down and make a new ideology. The whole NRM ideology is actually already a flawed one. NRM is actually, it's Museveni leading it. No one is going to go against him at all. In fact, it's even Museveni who says who's going to go for speakership. Okay. It is him. So NRM belongs mm -hmm. to him. So the only way NRM can actually make it out is if they reshuffle the whole system and if they choose a new person to represent the party. So I think the power within changing of our nation should first start within changing the parties that are on the nation. In the good spirit, I want to uh, interject a little bit on what he has just said. Okay, why are you done, Victor? Oh, I was just adding something small then. You yeah, can actually let, do let, let him finish. All oh, right, so mm. to, to wrap it all up, I think 
we need change. I think we need change within the ideologies of the political parties if we're to have a workable political uh, multi-party system. But then again, I think we don't need to preach that we need a new political party that does not have the right ideology for the country. Mm -hmm. But then I ultimately think I as a person, those are three different levels. The third level, I as a person, we just need to do with the political parties in and of themselves because they have failed to clean their houses. Okay. Before Veronica forgets mm -hmm. with what she wanted to add earlier, mm -hmm. let me no, give her a chance. I think... He answered. It. He answered it. Okay. Yes. Add a little when it's done. Okay. All right. Yes. He has concluded what I actually wanted to say that to hell with the political parties. We do not want it, even if it is in the constitution. If you ask me, I will emphasize this and say that we do not need political parties in Uganda because most of the chaos that we have in this country are uh, have been caused primarily by the political parties themselves. Because these people rally masses not on ideas, but just because they have hatred towards the other person there. Let's see what happened when Mugisa moved to marches out of the DC. A segment of people moved out of him. It seems, it, it, it does appear like um, he was the icon, the hallmark of the party itself. And by the time he's moving, you either move with him or else you are against him. That's exactly what happened. Now, what happened in BCJ? Oh, so, so, so Mugisa Muntu and Nandala Mafabi fighting in within themselves in the party for, uh, for, 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 for national candidature in the, in, in the 2016 polls. You get a point. There was a class between themselves on who should lead. Now, if a party does not understand itself, how would this party unite the, uh, the, 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 the masses outside. It, 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 it becomes tragic. Let's look at states, for example, like uh, the Saudi Arabia. They do not have parties, but this country is prosperous. This GDP is far better than Uganda itself. There are companies in Saudi Arabia that are richer than this country. For example, you say that they do not have parties, but they're doing well. Now, let's look at um, an ideal political party. Let's look at the, commun the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party. Ever since Mao Zedong established this party here, I'm quite sure um, Mao must be resting um, a thousand years, sorry, a hundred years into this whole year. But this party has been founded on principles and Chinese are subscribing to that. Now, we have parties that are established on stales. Each and every time, they fear breaking down. They fear falling. They fear collapsing. Now, what do they do is they... They, they, they mobilize people on their sentiments. They mobilize people based on their tribal sentiments, their inclinations. That's why you would say that in a party, um, a, a party such as DP ordinarily, history tells us it has been for the Catholics. You see that? Yeah. And it has been for the central people. UPC has been dominated by the northerners, the, the, the Delangis and all that. Now, if a party mobilizes people on such grounds, then it is tragic. We need to do all with it. Let's have merit altogether. In the period between um, 1986 to 1996, that period of a movement system, yes, it was good. Politics was based on merit, not on who follows who. You get, you get the point. People were followed basing on meritocracy, what they have to offer. But unfortunately, the unfortunate incident then was the, 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 the atmosphere for politics was not um, good enough. But had it been that we allow the movement system or uh, the, 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 uh, okay, the constitution abolishes single party rule in the country. But then if at all we can have one party or the movement system and people are voted basing on their capacities, that would be far better. We wouldn't be seeing situations where members and the funds would be stationed in, 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 in sorority when people are going to vote. We wouldn't be seeing people being um, uh, uh, rallied to riot and all that. People would be genuinely supporting ideas that they do believe in. How to Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, let me leave Victor to add something. Before yeah. yeah just to add that, that, actually, a very good practical example where we see political parties causing catastrophes within the university politics. Uh, you see, every time in university politics, there's someone from NRM. I'll talk about in Kumba University where I come from. You will see that at Kumba University, even if I, as Harold Sawanonda, a Muganda known by Sawanonda, wanted to actually go into getting a, 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 a primary card for NRM to stand for guild president, it didn't happen. They would find all ways of stopping me. What do I mean by this? The chaos is already happening there, the tribalistic kind of chaos. You know, we keep saying that we're a country that is fighting these things, nepotism, tribalism. We actually even go to school and even quote uh, people like uh, the, the French Revolution, such kings that yeah. they were nepotistic, they were tribalistic. But these things actually happen. We go to school and we study things like literature in the city. We read literature. Mm -hmm. whereby there was nepotism, but still the same things yeah. happen. Mm -hmm. So I actually think even within the university politics themselves, mm -hmm. 
chaos is already happening. Because actually, even if you are a northerner and you want to stand in NRM, you wouldn't succeed. Now, coming to Noob, Noob is actually being taken over. At least Noob may have some sort of change, but mostly by Uganda. So what I'm trying to say is that even the scales, you'll find that NRM people in Kumba University are trying to fight off the Noob people. The Noob are trying to fight off the FDC people. They fight from primaries, then they fight party to party. But what happens in Nkumba University, whereby we don't have political parties? That, that's, that's a light. That's a Kumba University that can have a light. Whereby Abdul can stand, I can stand against him, Proskovia can stand, and Veronica can stand. Mm. No one is going to be affiliated to any party. No one is going to stop Proskovia in her primaries. For Just to come out to that. You, you, you realize one interesting thing, that in, in the university politics, where a poem, a, a candidate is standing on, on, on a political party, this person would actually have an upper hand compared to the other one because a party says an RM will give you lots of funding to make sure that you win the election. For but the a person house. who has the capacity to uh, to lead, because he doesn't have the fundings, would definitely lose his elections. Okay, so your it. argument is that we should do away with political parties, we're, we're multi party state, and working. let yeah. everybody... Just want to emphasize that we do not need it ideally. Mm -hmm. it's, not, okay. it's not okay. That yeah. is my argument. Maybe because uh, one thing has a difference. <laughs> it's, it's my own too as well. Like you look at in the parliament. Now we have. Um, the, the opposition all together, even if we match them, they will not exceed 105 members of parliament. We have the ruling party dominating in the floor of parliament. So what is the essence? That every time causing chaos, clashing here and there, left, right, center, but there is no tangible thing that they're doing. So if at all, the parliament can have one um, uh, one system or one party, and then the, the, the disagreements are internally, not from maybe other side. That would be fair because a party has its different ideologies that they, 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 they subscribe to. Now, by the time you move this to the floor of parliament, they will go with this own, uh, with this mentality and they will oppose each and everything, notwithstanding their merits, by the way. Because the essence is winning the numbers, having the, the, the uh, for you to have the greater say, you need to have the numbers. Now, in a the, in, in the parliament which is so inflated with over 500 and uh, 500 plus people you would ideally expect and this is English adage by the way that two heads are better than one we have over 500 people in the parliament I will not call them dull but I expect better from them better ideas coming from them but you have people many in the parliament and they are not doing um, service to this country that is deplorable we cannot take such a thing. It's better we say to hell with the party let's vote people to this parliament basing on their capacities. Okay. So we are going to take a short break and still come back with more discussions on multi-party politics and other issues. Thank you. The Citizens Chatroom happens every Friday at 2 p.m. on Civic Space TV online on Facebook and YouTube. We invite you to be part of this conversation. Civic Space TV, freedom always. Welcome back from that break. We are still looking at the state of multi-party politics in Uganda. And I'm here with the students of Nkumba University. So let us continue with the discussion and I'll start with Veronica. So Veronica, looking at the relationship between NRM and multi-party politics in Uganda, let us start with 2000 where there was a serious campaign for uh, against multi-party politics mm -hmm. and then 90% voted against it. 2005, there was a serious campaign mm -hmm. and then against, I mean for it, then a big percentage voted for it. And now what I'm hearing from the panel uh, are difficulties in other political parties existing. So mm -hmm. what do you think about the relationship of NRM and multi-party politics. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Fancy. Uh, to begin with, if we are to look at the leader of the ruling party, NRM, he's, what should I say, he's someone who is so strategic. So, a strategist. Really, yeah. Okay. So ruling for thirty, is it thirty-five, thirty-five years? Mm. Yeah, I should be about that. If you are 1986 plus. But. Mm -hmm. So for ruling all those years, you have to be dynamic. You have to get to know, okay, now this is what they need and I'll give it to them. So by then, 2000, when people voted against, so you're like, okay, they still need this. Then by 2005, I think we see the coming up of different political activists like Mr. Kosemo, Gilili, who started preaching these things to the people like, you know what, this system is, not, is really not good. So these people started getting sensitized. They're like, now we need different political parties. You have to give it to them because they still wanted their favor. 
and people here were happy like you see he gives us what you want what we what we we, we really we, we want you, you know so he gives it to them and they get the political parties and even when we sit today he's still in control he still knows what to do and say at this point this is what is going to happen and yeah some people will be like you know what the opposition is a bad side because okay let us let me first speak about the funds the ipod the ipod funds like NRM gets, all political parties get, all political parties get. But then even the problem comes in with the opposition parties. The opposition parties are so relying on the NRM. They are, they are like, NRM, where do you get your funds from? But as citizens, like, who have studied, you can also ask opposition, where do you get your funds from? You get. So, literally, he, he still has the power. NRM still has the pol multi-party political system. He knows how to control. The party knows everything. So I think my opinion is the NRM still knows everything. And in particular, it is the head, the chairman. And trust me, if this party is given to another person, as Victor said in the first session, that maybe another leader of the party, of the NRM party comes in, trust me, it will be given a few years and it collapses. Okay. okay, I see, Victor, you want to All add right. something? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll borrow from the historian, as it was in the days of Otto von Metternich, mm -hmm. whereby Otto von Metternich was a very good strategist, where he controlled uh, the whole Europe, whereby he was the only one who knew all languages, the people in the whole conference knew, and he would actually translate what he actually desired. When the Queen of England says this to the King of France, he would say that the Queen of England has said this in a way that favors him. So this is what exactly what Museven is doing. Museven is just borrowing from Otto von Metternich. We look into the days of Otto von Metternich, whereby he controlled the whole press. That's what Museven is doing. He has most majority shares within the press, within the New Vision and other press, and other press companies. So meaning whatever he wants to be published will be published. So meaning whatever he feeds to the public is what they will actually get. But then again, leaving that aside, why do I mean by Otto von Metternich? Museven has this whole system in check, like Otto von Metternich had everything. Museven has a tight spy network, so he knows how to get his way around. He knows maybe how he will divide his political parties when he wants to. In fact, it's actually ironic that in the early 2000s, Mm -hmm. NRM was against the multi-party system, and then it did not work. But when Museven it felt like it, like it in 2005, and that's when it actually came about. So I actually think if you get from 1986 to 2005, he had enough time to prepare his set resources, he had enough time to prepare his army, and prepare himself for any multi-party kind of system. So what do we see in the current situation? The relationship between NRM and the multi-party system. NRM controls the multi-party system. First of all, it gives them the funds they get through iPod, 35 billion. But even the funds it gives them through iPod, it says that the party with majority seats should get majority of the money. So he ends up paying his own NRM, the funds he gets from iPod. But then leaving that aside, he controls the entire press. Leaving that aside, even during elections, when we could actually have a new wave of social media, maybe we could actually go through social media, people who know to get votes or anything, or to record any sort of vote rigging. He did that by checking on that. He put down the internet during elections. So I actually think Museveni, as I said, is the big bull in the crowd. NRM has been able to dominate everything. 35 years plus is enough time for someone to establish themselves. Okay, but also, Victor, if we go back to 2005, yes. uh, not just NRM, but also opposition campaigned for multi-party right. politics. Yeah. Don't you think it was a general consensus and even the people had, by, by that time understood probably the oh, benefits okay, okay. of multi-party politics? I, I actually think it was a general consensus even before 2005. But just when Museveni said it's now a general consensus, it's when it became a general consensus. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? Uh, this of, like, Paul Samogere said, by 1996, DP was already fronting a multi-party kind of agenda. Mm -hmm. And Museveni would hear this, he would just keep quiet, because he didn't want it. By 2001, everyone fronted, 2000, they had to vote for it, and people were against it. Museveni didn't want it. But now when Museveni wants it, all oh, Museveni's interests are aligned with other people's interests. It's when we actually have it at the end of the day. So I actually think that Museveni or the NRM in and of themselves have consolidated themselves enough to control the multi-party system. They control the funds they get. They control the, the media houses, the news that is spread out. They control the social media. Right now, Facebook was still under lock. I think it's still under lock. Yeah, right? It's still so, under lock. So they are controlling everything at the end of the day. He has ministers that are everywhere. And, and even when you have maybe DP saying we should have a multi-party system, 
Puan Nubat Mawa, so they've been dissolved also. And not only has, been, has it been dissolved, it has been made a minister of constitutional affairs. Mm -hmm. So meaning he's under the ministry, all under the cabinet of Museveni. He's actually under now direct power and control of Museveni. But it's not surprising. Why? Because even during the signing uh, of the NRMDP agreement, Museveni was heard saying that uh, Nubat Mawa was one of the people who wasn't giving him hard time. If you look at the elections, DP always had a back seat to whatever was happening. If Nubat is trying to go and, and, and get elections by force to try to campaign, DP was just standing behind. But I actually think a line needs to be drawn between NRM DP agreement and NRM Nobat Mao agreement. Because I actually think, like Abdul said, just because leaders of parties believe in something, they want to force a whole party to go down that whole drain. How sure are we that ask the opinions of the people in DP, different people, they will actually don't want to sign that agreement. But then again, we see no, but Mao always taking the back seat, meaning he was always prepared for this agreement. He just needed an, an opportune time to do so. So if NRM is dissolving DP, is dissolving uh, Betty Kamiya, is dissolving very many parties, and then again the parties which are not dissolved by NRM is giving them the funds and is taking on them like out of them and it's dead. Then we actually think the relationship between NRM and multi party politics is that this is just one thing. Okay, let's let's get into that discussion. Let me bring before I bring back. Um, Veronica and Abdul, let me bring Proskovia into the discussion. Proskovia, we are talking about the, let's have that discussion of the DP NRM cooperation agreement that sure. Victor just opened. But prior to that, we have seen other crossovers as well. Oh. Yes, we saw, yeah, like you said, we saw Honorable Betty Kamia crossing over. Even within opposition, we saw the Lord Mayor crossing over. Uh, we saw Honorable Betty Namboze crossing over to NUP. So what effect does that have on multi-party politics? Uh, to me, it could be a positive effect. When you see someone crossing over, then that person, it, he, she, she or he has no reason to fight the other party. And she, she or he has found that they have this, the, very, the same intention to serve the country. So when numbers crossed over to Nope, then she was she saw that there was they there's nothing they're fighting. They had the same idea and they, when they merge together it's like united we we stand and divided we fall. So they, they were all under the opposition and their aim was to fight the government and to serve in their own ideologies. Then when we see Mao crossing over to to NRM. NRM. Uh, not really crossing over to NRM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For Mao, Mao says it is just an alliance of DP and NRM. But we saw also a crossover of Honorable Betty Kamia. Okay, I'll, I'll insist with a crossover because the question was centering on okay. crossover. So, to me, it was a positive crossover because they will merge and they will stand together and fight that. The what? The government. So to me, it was a positive idea, and I will support the crossovers because we are all aiming at the positivity of our nation. We're not aiming at when we fight, we won't do anything for us, and it is even reducing on the on on the, the on what I, I can say. I can call it. It is reducing on these fights that on the conflicts. You see, when a president stands and. We see in, like, recurrently, we saw that the number of opposition MPs, they were rising compared to the other years. Is it, is it a bad thing? It is good because we're seeing that the opposition is really sh exposing. When they stand and they fight over one thing, then we shall be successful at the end of the day. People are there, they're observing, they're seeing what is taking place in the country, and they'll be sensitized on which government to with and which one so i still support the crossover and it is really a good idea to cross okay. another party okay so up let me bring up so Abdul, let's talk about mm. the dp nrm agreement that the discussion started from victor to mm. proscovia now to you what do you think it's its effect on multi-party politics all right um the question you just asked is related with the former you asked which is about um whether the multi-party politics is in favor of the NRM or plays in favor of NRM. And I want to begin by saying that, yes, apparently 
the multi-party politics is the oxygen upon which NRM government is sustaining itself on power. And how does NRM do this? By making sure that the parties are at loggerheads amongst themselves, this gives him room to lead the country, to, uh, to, to, to have whole, a strong grip of power. Now, when, when you saw Besije marching out of FDC, I'm quite sure he didn't do it willingly. He did it because it's a forum for democratic party uh, change and he must demonstrate that there's democracy there he exits but he, you very well recall that in 2006 he still had intentions of running <coughs> he ran actually now you'd say that when he marched out the people who subscribed to him who followed him too when um mugisa muntu went to polls against uh, nandala mafabi honorable by the way um the, 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 there was a split within the party itself. There are others who were pro Nandela Mafabi and there are those others who were pro to Mugisa Muntu. Now, uh, at, at, at a certain point in time, you also see that Mugisa Muntu marching out of the party, FDC itself, are moving away. Meanwhile, all these incidences are happening. You see that FDC becoming weaker and weaker. Their representation in the parliament is diminishing each and every time a situation like that happens. Now, Let's recall the situation in DP. When Paul Kawanga Semogrere decided to move from DP, that was the beginning of, of, of the death of DP itself because it weakened. Other people were justifying that his alliance with the government was right. Others said no. And that was the genesis of the feuds within the party itself. Now, a person such as um, Lord uh, Lord Mayor Eris Fukuago marching out of DP into FDC, that was a big blow to the, uh, to the party itself because um, uh, the, 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 the Lord Mayor is a big witch in the party and he has followers on his own accord as well. Now, by the time this person moves out of this party here, he creates a big lacoon, uh, a, 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 a big vacuum mm -hmm. that has to be filled. Now, this person doesn't go alone. He moves with his disciples. Now, the party is weakened further. Now, this is how dangerous the multi-party politics is. Now, by the time parties or members have conflicts within themselves, a person wants to form another party somewhere. And what happens? When a party is formed, the budget is expanded. The iPod fund, of course, it has to be increased to cater for all these, uh, uh, for all these uh, parties. Where does iPod get this funding from? From the national coffers. So if we are increasing on expenditure unnecessarily altogether. Now, you recall within DP itself, the, the, the Young Democrat Forum. I think it, it's being spearheaded by the, the learned, um, what's his name? Oh, I'm forgetting his name. Honorable... Matthews, sorry, I'm forgetting his name, but uh, anyway, when he decided to form a party, a faction within itself, uh, or, or within DP itself, yeah. that was a split within the house That's itself. That's the Uganda Young Democrats. Exactly, Uganda Young Democrats, being uh, spearheaded by, uh, why am I forgetting the name of this honorable member, of, um, member in this African Legislative mm -hmm. Assembly, which is his name? Anyone can recall. Mbide. Mbide, yes, Honorable Mukasa Mbide. Now, this, part, this man alone is causing headache within his own party. And to whose merit is it? Isn't it to NRM? I did say prior that the political parties are the oxygen, the, the oxygen upon which NRM is sustaining itself on too. Because these parties are fighting internally, they forget upon touching okay. the state house. So, yeah, so the issue of the crossovers. Mm. Uh, even if within within the opposition mm. and also to NRM and mm. from NRM. Mm. And surprisingly, from NRM is rare. But from opposition to NRM, we see a lot happen. Mm. So those crossovers and then the agreements, such as the DP, mm. NRM Corporation Agreement. Mm. Do you think these are things that should exist in a multi-party state? All right, ordinarily... The, 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 I did say earlier on that the hallmarks of a multi-party dispensation is one freedom of assembly, freedom of expression. So which means that you, if you think that NRM is a better voice, you're free to match there and should not be questioned altogether. Mm -hmm. But now the problem comes in, and I did say this quite earlier on, that the problem of the party is it is being tied on individuals. By the time Mao shifts from, uh, from, from, from MOOP, 
So, so, so from DP to NRM, it becomes a big news. It becomes a headline. Uh, no, but Mao for the start is not the ideology. It's okay if at all he chooses to go, let him go. Let there be someone within the party that can rise to that rank there. But in a situation that we cry because Mao has left the DP and then there's a big problem. Mao's departure shouldn't be a headline. It shouldn't be a big deal. This is my respective um, opinion. We make this a, a headline over, um, over important things, the important things that this country can talk about. Now, we had um, issues with a... Uh, uh, with the coffee deal, DP was not on the on the media talking about this. There are several um, issues in this country that the parties are not talking about, not until nobody Mao decides to match, of which is his right to do anyway. He matches the other side there, and people are remaining mute about this. I don't, I don't think that this is a big deal we should really worry about okay. because it has been happening, and I'm quite sure several do happen. If at all I am a DP member and I choose to match, nobody will know about it, and nobody will care. What about this guy here? Because I do stand for a, a thing, and I hold it dear unto myself. Okay, mm. so let's conclude that mm. direct discussion. Mm. So with Veronica. So, Veronica, the issue of multi-party politics and the different loopholes that have been pointed out by the panelists, do you think it's something that is fixable? Or should we move to a different political system? I think entirely the multi-party system in Uganda is entirely fixable. It can be fixed. If I'm to begin, to begin with the opposition, the essence of opposition opposing someone I'm not opposing, let me say I'm opposing Harold. I'm not opposing Harold as a personality or how he grew up. I'm opposing Harold's ideology. So to begin with the opposition, the opposition should stop having the same strategy or the same goal. When you ask these opposition parties what is their goal, they'll all tell you we are removing, you know, we are removing the dictator, mm -hmm. we are removing Museveni. I think there are better things to look at except removing Museveni. So that is why the president of this country, right now, he has control over everything. Why? Because the opposition parties, there are things they should be looking at. But instead, they decide to concentrate on one thing. We are removing the president, we are removing the NRM government. And that gives the NRM government an opportunity to exploit more other things. Mm -hmm. But there are better things the opposition parties should concentrate on. Small, small things, they'll give us better things. You know, like, let me give an example. If there's a local local chairperson of the village who is, uh, who is doing something contrary, why do these opposition parties jump that person and they want to remove something bigger? We fight that person, you know? From the ground come building up, make sure hospitals... You know? Precisely, let me add, with the permission, we have uh, deplorable medical conditions in this country here. Workers' wages are... Are laughable. They don't really appreciate workers' their efforts, and so many things. The economy itself, the inflation is high, but the parties are not talking about it. They are talking about petty things that she's emphasizing about. If at all, the the parties can address these pressing issues here and leave the politics. Politics, I do think, um, will cater for itself. Let there be food on the table. Let the government make it easier for people to work. Let them not be overtaxed. Let the, the, the let the institution be um, let the policies accommodate individual entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, there are a lot of foreign investors who are coming to sell tea. By the way, who are coming to uh, be receptionists in hotels and all that. Yet Ugandans are there who can do these jobs here, but the parties are not talking about this. They are focusing on petty things which do not matter, but the important things are not being talked about. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, yes. okay. Mm. So um, thank you. Uh, so I think these political parties should concentrate on, um, you know, everything that happens. By the way, they talk about the inflation and all the hospitals, but they bring it in a bad way. Like they say, uh, the hospital bills are very high. Mr. M7 is doing this. Why don't you squeeze the Ministry of Health? You can, the opposition can do that. You can squeeze the Ministry of Health. Why do you go to Mr. M7? He has a lot to deal with. So if you squeeze all these ministries, they will go on correcting everything. So make sure down is fine, then you come up and fight the main person. So I think this is entirely fixable. If the opposition parties should change their ideologies, should change their goal of removing the president, and they leave down these down major things. Okay. So Victor, let's talk about the size of parliament. Mm. 
Uh, and specifically, just like the previous weeks, let's discuss the presence Excuse of me. the... Yes. I, I would like to talk about Veronica's issue. Okay, briefly. About yeah. fixation. Uh, to me, I think the opposition has really tried to fix, especially when it comes to prices, they've tried to negotiate, and whenever they tr come out to speak out their mind, they are being threatened. So how would they indeed, like, someone will stand. I'll give an example when Bobby Wine comes, uh, recently VCJ came out as a, a leader of, mm -hmm. to, to demonstrate. To demonstrate. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. when he moved on the streets, what did they do to him? That's why they are centering on removing a dictator, like how they term it anyway. Okay. <laughs> it's not me terming it, that trait has been there. Okay, that's so, why I say their ministry is responsible for these things. Why don't we attack the ministries? Yes, when he stands on the street to speak about the inflation, then he's indirectly attacking the minister. Okay, let's, okay, thank you, Proskovia. Let's shift the discussion now mm. to presence of the army in parliament. All Victor, right. what do you think about that? Okay, uh, to wrap up everything, about crossovers, I feel like I need to say something about crossovers. So, so I would like to agree with him on a point that crossovers are always going to happen. Because you see, if I'm a part, I'm a part of DP. I'm not enslaved to DP. I'm not enslaved to being there my whole life. So I have a freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can choose where I want to be. So crossovers will always happen. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what is the impact of these crossovers on political parties? That is where we draw the line. So knowing that the impact of a crossover of uh, uh, areas to Kwago, as you say, is actually going to be very detrimental to a political party. Then you ask ourselves, why is it detrimental? It is because he has influence. Then you ask ourselves, why does he have influence? It's out of his own personal merit. So we're not going to blame him for his influence and tie him to where he does not want to be. Now the problem comes in with the existence of a political party in the first place. Let him have his influence out of his merit, but not under political party. In that way, we so need to... So in other words, he should not move with the political party. Absolutely. He should not move with the political party. So then moving on to the size of the parliament. So if you look at the size of the parliament, we're having majority seats coming in from the NRM. I'm going to add that up with the whole discussion of the presence of the army in the parliament, right? So majority of the seats are coming within the NRM. So meaning every single motion that is being fronted is going to be pro-NRM. Why is this detrimental? Because because we get to understand three things that happen within our political sphere. That is uh, the doctrine of separation of powers. We have the legislature, we have the judiciary, and uh, the executive, right? Mm -hmm. So the legislature, actually, I think, is, is, um, is one of the most important arms of the government. For every single motion that is drawn to help me, to help Veronica, to help Abdul, a motion on abortion, a motion on, 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 on education, is actually going to help the country. What happens if we have majority seats being pro-NRM? That means we're going to have a country that is pro-NRM. We're going to lack diversity. We're going to have uh, the, the stakeholders, that's the day-to-day -day person being tortured or not getting the right policy he has to get just because Muslim does not think he needs to get that. So I think the size of parliament is actually very detrimental to us and actually getting more detrimental for more districts are being formed within Western Uganda where NRM knows, is, NRM knows it is well affiliated. But not only that, even in these small districts where by forming more districts, these small new districts, NRM will actually go on and gang up send its leaders to campaign for that person and they end up actually winning an election. They will win it by force or actually rightly. So leaving that aside, the presence of the army, adding it all up. So if we have many seats coming from NRM, we're having a pro-NRM motion being put in day in, day out. Then at the same time, we have the presence of the army. Yes, we could understand that the army is a special group in parliament, but why have those many people in the parliament? And then again, uh, issues of the army and civilians are very different, right? That is why the army people are tried within the court marshals and civilians have their own cases. So I think even if the army wants to listen to what happens in the parliament, they're actually a special group that may not actually need that but even if they needed that we don't have to have that big number of people in the parliament so i would set up my whole argument on the whole thing of toji kuatako so what happened during that time we had the army flooding in during the parliament so if the army is trying to involve itself within the issues of the legislature we're actually having no independence of the arms of the government at the end of the day that is now the tyranny Museveni said he would run away from. We're seeing it happening in broad daylight. What happens to me as a Friday speaker, because some people are Friday, I'm going to chair a motion that I'm seeing uh, different, different army people in the parliament that can actually be intimidated. Mm -hmm. So what happens in such a world? I think in the world we are in right now, the biggest detriment we have under the so-called multi-party politics is that NRM is having the biggest seats in the parliament. That is why we need to see the biggest detriment that happens at the end of the day. So I think the army shouldn't be in the parliament because it's a special group. But even if it is in the parliament, you don't have to have that many number of people. But then I think the number of MPs 
falling on NRM and the number of MPs falling on opposition is not good at the end of the day. It makes us have a pro-NRM country, which we actually don't want. Okay, let me leave Abdul to conclude on that discussion. We have run out of time. All right, it's okay. Um, the presence of the army in the parliament is a big blow to the country itself. We do not need them in the parliament. Like he has just stated, there are three arms of the government, and we do understand that the parliament or the legislature is a civil institution. It is not a military institution, so there is no need for the army to be there in the first place. There is the high command, which belongs to the army exclusively. Now, I don't know who told this government that um, it is only the UPDF who can represent themselves in the floor of parliament. I, I believe that is problematic. Now, we do not want people who can swing blows so well. You remember during the Tojikota incident, which uh -huh. he has just cited, how General Katumba Omala was so swift in giving free blow to Bob Wine. <laughs> like, we don't need such kind Real of people. Judge. Those are monsters. Uh, uh, otherwise, everybody has to go for boxing lessons. Now. Uh, exactly. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the inflated size of the parliament is not just because of the presence of the UPDF there alone. We have... Um, we have the women representatives. Okay, we do talk about gender equality, and I believe by this time around, we have achieved that. Let people, let the government tell people that you are, you, you have the power, you can do this, you can compete against the men, by, uh, and under equal footing, you can do it. To me, by the and this is my respective opinion, to tell me that you need to have a special person to represent a woman in the okay. parliament is an insult. You, you, you already, you're running away from that. But let me say this is very important, yeah? Yes. If <laughs> at all women are given the same footing with men they can compete and defeat them there is no presumption that it's only a woman who should represent okay, a woman Victor, in the front okay let me just this ask you that something connected to that up yes, to. Yes, yes. so uh the woman representative position was mm. brought up as affirmative action exactly. against marginalized groups mm. even with its presence mm. Um, it was first of all brought up so that the women mm. are able to come to parliament and be mm. at the forefront of leadership. Mm. Do you, even with its presence, mm. there are very few women who are competing under direct seats. Do you think when we take that away, mm. we will still have women in equal number as men in parliament? Now, you see, um, my, 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 my issue is this, the inflated size of the parliament itself. Let's say women should compete. There's no mercy. Yes, I do appreciate the affirmative action is very important and I do believe that by this time around we've attained that objective there. Women do know that they are supposed to vote. Now, I should not care whether they vote for a fellow woman or not, but the issue is this. By having it in place that women should be represented there, I believe there were 400 of them represent so sort of 100 plus adding on to the general districts and all that. This inflates the size of the parliament. We don't need a, a, a large parliament. The youths, let's talk about the youths as well, who says that it's only a youth who can represent a youth, a fellow youth in the floor of parliament. What about the, 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 the MPs, the members of parliament for the district themselves? They can do this as well. So you realize that we are, we are, we are doing monotony of power or functions. We are monotonizing the functions okay. of the people. So Ab Abdu, I'll just catch you right there. We have run out of time. We will make a discussion around that and surely Abdu will be part of that panel. I also want to be part of that panel. <laughs> yeah, sure. <No>. So, <laughs> so I'll get, I would like to get your mm. concluding remarks in less than one minute each. Mm. All right. Uh, on the way forward for this country. Okay, yeah. So my concluding remarks on the way forward for this country, what I actually think of that two things can happen. We could actually retain the multi-party system and do amendments to it, like take, taking it down and really breaking it down from the start, do new ideologies and new leaders. But I actually think the better solution is actually if we have no political parties at all. But I think if multi-party politics can't work, then you can actually have a dual party political system, whereby you have two parties, like it is in America, the Democrats and the Republicans. And within these parties, there's always a change on a person who comes in for a new town. I think that can actually be a workable thing. So what I think as a closing remark, one thing we need to understand as youths, we should not actually fall onto the mistakes that our fathers did. We need to understand ideology. We don't need to oppose someone or support a political party or to support I am pro NRM everything NRM is going to say it is right I think we need to support people by what they bring on the table so okay. closing it up one thing I want us to understand is that multi-party politics are there but actually very detrimental right now and the laws the framework is just theoretical and not practical so whatever views I've actually given here to wrap it up actually my own views as I as a person I have no I have no problem with anyone else who has any other kind of 
oppos opposition views. So that's what I think. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yes, Veronica. Uh, as to conclude, I want, um, I pray the citizens of this country, they get to know the essence of multi-party politics. It's not removing a president. No, it is entirely something different, opposing very many ideas. We, can, we have, like, opposition have very, has very many platforms to oppose. But it's not entirely about removing the president. Everything it's about removing the president. So I believe the opposition should shift their minds to first settling other things. Then maybe after five years when the elections are back, that will be 2026. 20, when the elections are back, then maybe we can concentrate now. Okay, let, let us remove him. But for now, I think let us concentrate, press the party in power to improve a lot of things. Okay, thank you, Abdul. All right, yes, we see in Uganda every election period is followed by a planning for the next election and this is tragic why is this one happening because political parties are so much interested in grab uh, in grabbing state power but i do think if at all we deal away with the political parties that would be even way better for the country because um we have seen the political parties balkanizing this country into segments into fragments it's at loggerheads with the other. So if at all we can do away with these parties here, and trust me, this is my prophecy, that the ruling government, which you don't want to say, will suffocate. Because even within NRM itself, now competition will begin to start. Apparently, within the party itself, no one can compete against the president. Now, if at all we do away with the multi-party dispensation, it will be fair for people to compete based on their merits, and it will be far better for the country. Yeah. Okay, Proskovia. Uh, may I just make a prayer to the government because my colleagues have said it all. Uh, in my own view, I've noticed that the government has not yet accepted the influence of multi-party politics in the country. The way it treats those people, the opposition and blah, blah, blah. So I would have, I just pray the government to just accept and let it promote equality because I've not seen any equality in this Okay. okay. So thank you so much, panelists. Thank you for being very articulate and thank you for coming for this talk show. So we have come to the end of two days debate and that was the inter-university debate and it's brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV and today we hosted the students of Nkumba University. See you again next week, same time with another university. Bye.